Well, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome here in London this morning to our friends and co-hosts in Hong Kong. I'm absolutely delighted to be here today for the 29th launch of the Global Financial Centers Index, and we're delighted that this is being done in a truly global way. Uh, despite things like pandemics, the great wonders of technology allow us to be together and to share some of the results today. Now, you'll know me. I'm Professor Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors of Zien, and I'm really only able to be able to present things like this thanks to the generosity of our sponsors and partners. In particular today, um, I'd like to thank uh, Hong Kong for participating. But also, as ever, we are doing this with our dear friends, the China Development Institute. So it really is a truly global cooperation. Now, our program today is packed. We have a lot of things to talk about. We, do, we have saved some time for questions and answers, but in many ways, my job is to get out of the way. Uh, let me just explain. Uh, today, we're going to have a presentation, a recorded presentation uh, from Mr. Christopher Wei, the Secretary for Financial Services in the Treasury uh, in Hong Kong. After that presentation, my colleague, Mike Wardle, who's the director and head of our indices, We'll be presenting the core of the results. I'll be making a few short observations, and then we will have two responses, uh, one from Dr. Yuling Chu uh, at CDI and one from Dr. King Logao uh, at the SDC. So it's really quite packed and lots of time for questions and comments at the end. I might point out just a few things. Uh, first, please do use the question facility in the GoToWebinar room. That will have your email attached to it. So we can respond to direct and specific questions after this. The results will be up uh, in just a few minutes online, the report. Uh, there is also a Chinese version that will be posted, thanks to our friends at CDI. The recording itself will be available uh, later today, we hope, later today, London time, early tomorrow in Hong Kong. So I hope that covers most of the basic housekeeping rules. And just on a personal point, it is amazing, having begun doing this research back in 2003, starting the index in 2005, I certainly never dreamed that we would be moving on to the 29th edition. Anyway, Mike, with no more ado, uh, could you just uh, quickly show the guests that we have today? And we're going to move to uh, Mr. Hui's presentation uh, from Hong Kong SAR. Mike, over to you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to join the Global Financial Centers Index 29 launch webinar today, and I'm also delighted to share with you the latest development of Hong Kong's financial services industry. Before I start, I must thank the ZEN Group and China Development Institute for surveying global market participants periodically and compiling the widely recognized Global Financial Centers Index. Through examining the results of the index, we are given the opportunity to understand how Hong Kong is perceived as an international financial center and how we can continuously improve ourselves. Given global financial markets are dynamic and fast moving, feedback from the report will be very important and also valuable as we look for new opportunities to enhance our competitiveness. Comprehensive and superb financial services are crucial for an economy gearing for high quality development. The value added of the financial service industry in Hong Kong accounted for 21% of our GDP in 2019. Its share of the overall employment increased from 6.8% in 2018 to 7.1% in 2019. Hong Kong has always been an offshore financial center for many enterprises and also an important conduit for international capital to enter the mainland market. The capital markets of Hong Kong and the mainland can complement and interact positively with each other. In the last report published in September 2020, Hong Kong was one of the top five leading financial centers in the world, rising by one place from the March issue of the index in 2020. And we were particularly recognized in the areas of business environment and human capital. For your latest results this time, we are glad to learn that Hong Kong is once again rising by one place and will be ranked one of the top four leading financial centers globally. We also note that the overall ratings of financial centers ranked among the top positions in the report will be very close. 
Hong Kong's financial markets have indeed performed very well over the last year. Despite challenges and uncertainties presented by the COVID-19 pandemic, our markets demonstrated resilience and robust performance in terms of IPO runs funds raised and trading volume. We rank number two globally by IPO funds raised in 2020, amounting to over 50 billion US dollars, and recording a year-on-year increase of 27%. In terms of average daily turnover in our securities market last year, the volume reached over 16 billion US dollars, representing an increase of 47%. Besides our traditional strength as an international financial center, this outstanding performance is attributed to the listing reform we introduced in 2018, allowing companies with weighted voting rights and pre-revenue or pre-profit biotech companies to list in Hong Kong. Leveraging the reform, not only is Hong Kong a preferred international fundraising platform now, it is also the world's second largest fundraising hub for biotech companies. Altogether, there have been 43 companies listed under the new listing regime in Hong Kong since its introduction, raising a total of over 54 billion US dollars and accounting for about 40% of the total IPO funds raised in this period. These companies have a combined market cap of over 1.4 trillion US dollars, accounting for about a quarter of the current total market cap of Hong Kong. They include 10 China concept stock companies returning to Hong Kong for secondary listing and 31 pre-revenue or pre-profit biotech companies. Our early efforts in enhancing the listing regime are gradually delivering results. Building on a good foundation, the Financial Secretary has recently announced in his budget a comprehensive plan to bring our market to a new level that would cover the development of green and sustainable finance and our bond market and the consolidation and launch of four of these schemes and setting out a blueprint for medium to long-term development of our markets. Having regard to Hong Kong's goal of achieving carbon neutrality before 2050, we will continue to promote the development of green and sustainable finance and encourage institutions to conduct relevant investment, financing, and certification activities and attract top-notch institutions and talent to Hong Kong to provide the relevant services. We will join hands with the financial sector and relevant stakeholders to take forward the strategic plan announced end last year by our Green and Sustainable Finance Cross Agency Steering Group, thereby leveraging our role as the International Financial Center to mobilize capital towards sustainable projects in the region and enhance our position as a green and sustainable finance hub in the region. We will first raise the existing borrowing limit applicable to government bond and green bond by over 12 billion US dollars respectively, such that there is room for the government to issue bonds regularly having regard to market situation and demand. Bonds issued by the Hong Kong government are indeed very much welcomed by international investors, as we successfully offered the second batch of government green bonds totaling 2.5 billion US dollars in January, among which the 30-year tranche is the longest tenor bond issued by the government and the longest tenor USD dominated government bond in Asia to date. Building on this good momentum, within the next five years, we will issue more than 22 billion US dollars of green bonds and we will also pioneer the issuance of retail green bonds such that the investing public can also participate in this emerging market. Through the active promotion of the government, Hong Kong's bond market has seen sustained growth, now ranking third in Asia, excluding Japan, in terms of total amount of bond issuances. To further develop the market, we will enhance efficiency and capacity of the Central Money Markets Unit, the bond market infrastructure of Hong Kong, to support future commissioning of Bond Connect southbound trading and also to develop CMU as an international major central securities depository in the long run. The Financial Secretary will also chair a steering group comprising us as the Policy Bureau, our banking securities, insurance regulators, and our exchange operator to formulate a roadmap for promoting diversified development of our bond market 
given that the global low interest rate environment will persist for a considerable long period, and many people in the community, especially the elderly, prefer investment options of steady and reliable returns. We plan to continue to issue no less than three billion U.S. dollars of silver bonds and no less than 1.9 billion U.S. dollars of I bonds this year. The eligible age of subscribing silver bonds will be lowered from 65 to 60. Next, I will cover our subsidy schemes. Recognizing the importance of green and sustainable finance as a global trend, the first subsidy scheme that we have launched is also targeted. To develop the market, we will consolidate our existing pilot bond grant scheme and green bond grant scheme into a three-year green and sustainable finance grant scheme to be launched in mid 2021. And the scheme will focus on green and sustainable financial products, covering more product types, external assessments, and expenditure types. This scheme is expected to encourage more issuance of green financial products in Hong Kong. Such that capital will be channeled for job projects, making positive environmental and social impact. The second scheme will subsidize open-ended fund company OFC, and it is the fourth step that we take to develop our fund market further to the early establishment of new fund structures, provision of tax concessions for carry interest, and legislative proposal to allow redomiciliation of funds. The scheme will provide subsidies to over 70% of the expenses paid to local professional service providers for OFCs set up in or redomiciled to Hong Kong in the coming three years, subject to a cap of about 130,000 US dollars per OFC. We are confident that the scheme would encourage the set up of more OFC in Hong Kong and consolidate our role as an international asset and wealth management center. The third scheme would subsidize REITs, real estate investment trusts, and cover 70% of expenses paid to local professional service providers for the listing of REITs in Hong Kong, subject to a cap of 1 million US dollars per REIT. This would allow Hong Kong to capture the opportunities offered by listing of REITs with mainland real estates or new infrastructures, for example, logistics and IT as underlying assets. As interest rate is expected to stay low for a more prolonged period of time, and as we face an increasingly aging population, REITs as potential products would offer the public an additional investment option for the purpose of retirement planning. The fourth scheme will subsidize issuance of insurance-linked securities, for example, catastrophic bonds by insurance companies or other institutions in Hong Kong, and the amount of grants for each issuance. Will be kept at around 1.5 million US dollars. Also, to develop Hong Kong as an insurance and international risk management center, we are currently undertaking a series of legislative work to provide for half-rate profit tax concessions to eligible insurance businesses, including marine insurance and specialty insurance, expand the scope of insurable risk of captive insurance companies, and enhance the group-wide supervision framework. We are also preparing for the implementation of a risk-based capital regime for the insurance industry to replace the rule-based capital adequacy regime. Besides offering subsidies, we will also plan ahead to enhance the competitiveness of our market, expand our various connect programs with the mainland market, and set our blueprint for further development of our own market. With regard to the securities market development. The stock exchange will review the overall secondary listing regime, including whether Greater China companies with non-weighted voting rights have to be companies in the field of I and T and to seek secondary listing in Hong Kong through the new concessionary route, as well as the market cap requirements. Moreover, we have noted a new trend of special purpose acquisition companies backs in the global financial market. Our regulator stock exchange. Would explore suitable listing regimes in view of this new trend to enhance the competitiveness of Hong Kong as an international financial center, while at the same time safeguarding the interests of the investing public. Hong Kong is known to have launched a number of connect schemes, allowing efficient assets between the mainland and international capital markets, covering both stocks and bonds.
these connect schemes have been very successful as demonstrated by usage statistics. For Stock Connect, we noted average daily turnover increased by 119% and 126% year on year, respectively, for northbound and southbound trading in 2020. Bond Connect has also reached record volume in 2020 and is now providing access to mainland interbank bond market to over 2,300 market participants. Having regard to the successful experience of these Connect schemes, we have planned to expand them and to further enhance the role of Hong Kong to connect the mainland and international capital markets. For Stock Connect, there will be progressive inclusion of ETFs and other types of assets, as well as expansion of the scope of eligible securities. Also, to cater for the increased allocation from international investors into the mainland Asia's market and the resulting risk management demand, our exchange operator will accelerate the preparation for the launch of Asia's index futures contract in Hong Kong. For Bond Connect, our banking regulator and the People's Bank of China have set up a working group to drive the Southbound Trading Initiative with the target of launching it within this year. Last but not least, Hong Kong can contribute more proactively to our country's dual circulation strategy. The FSTB, together with KMA, SFC, and IA, has set up a joint working group to explore how Hong Kong can complement the economic and financial development of our country and meet the needs of financial investors and examine how to further enhance Hong Kong's competitiveness as an international financial center on the basis of our existing capacities. It will set out the development blueprint and our forward concrete proposal and measures for engagement with central authorities and to secure their support. To conclude, I would like to thank the Yan Group and China Development Institute once again for their work in compiling Global Financial Centers Index. I also note that our own Financial Service Development Council, FSDC, in Hong Kong is a member of the Vantage Financial Centers Networks supporting the work on Global Financial Centers Index. We look forward to further cooperation with all of you as we seek to continuously improve Hong Kong's status and role as an international financial center. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hui, for those very perceptive remarks and those announcements about uh, Hong Kong. And uh, we are delighted to have a, an overview there. We'll be hearing more, of course, from FSDC in a moment. But now, Mike, over to you, the man who does the hard work and leads the team uh, for the results. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm, I'm Mike Wardle. I'm the Director and Head of Indices for the CN Group um, and take a lead in uh, developing and uh, writing the Global Financial Centers Index. Um, and the index is part of the work we do as part of the long finance program uh, run at CN, uh, which is, is seeking to ask, answer the question, when would we know our financial system is working? Um, and this is why we do longitudinal research, uh, looking at uh, change over time, because we're interested in uh, how finance and financial centers uh, can uh, make a difference uh, in the world. The GFCI is a factor assessment index. This is a way that we use to um, look at uh, data. It combines two different sets of data. One, uh, survey data, asking experienced professionals uh, their views. Uh, about financial centers um, and sets of quantitative data um, which we combine using uh, a machine learning algorithm uh, which uh, looks at the correlations uh, between people's uh, views and the uh, quantitative data which underlies that. And we are able to use those uh, correlations uh, to predict how an individual uh, would rate uh, financial centers even those that they don't uh, know personally. The GFCI now covers uh, 114 uh, financial centers uh, across the world. Um, it was 47, I think, in the first edition back in 2007, um, but now it's 114 with 12 other centers um, that we are tracking um, and who may well enter the index at some point. And I think the point here is that um, being a financial center um, is seen as a key driver uh, to local economies, uh, to countries' economies, um, and to um, supporting trade and commerce 
uh, throughout the world. Just looking uh, at who it is who gets involved in the GFCI in terms of those who respond to the uh, survey that we run. Uh, first of all, to say we really do have a broad range of people across financial services sectors uh, who take part. Um, generally, uh, we have people um, across banking, fintech, government and regulatory, uh, insurance, investment management, uh, and that gives us some confidence that um, you know, we're reaching uh, the right audience. Uh, secondly, the respondents by region. The great majority of those um, who respond to the survey are now from the Asia-Pacific region. Um, some 67% of respondents are from that uh, region of the world, I think which demonstrates, um, you know, first of all, the financial uh, and economic uh, growth that has been uh, in Asia-Pacific, uh, but also the tremendous interest there is um, in the development of uh, financial centres for the future. So the results of the index itself. Um, first of all, a brief look at the top 20 centres uh, in the GFCI 29. Um, London and New York um, is still at numbers one and two, but New York hangs on very clearly to the top place. Uh, London has dropped back in the ratings, though hangs on to second place. And there's very close uh, rating differences between London, Shanghai, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore uh, at the top of the table. Looking at regional performance over time, we take here the, the top five centres in each region and take an average of their ratings. Uh, there's been a slight falling back um, in GFC 29, the leading, re leading regions. Uh, but the point here is that uh, Asia Pacific has been leading this analysis for some time um, with a, a number of centres now firmly established uh, at the top of the rankings. Looking at the top five centres in the index and their ratings over time, uh, what we see is that uh, London fell back a bit here, um, and as I said, there's very close um, you know, uh, performance between London, Shanghai, Hong Kong and Singapore. But the key message here is how much more competitive the top of the index has become over time uh, as the ratings have narrowed uh, and performance has improved uh, so that people are catching up. And the story in terms of ranks over time um, really is the story of uh, Shanghai. Um, who is now firmly established in the leading centres in the GFCI, uh, taking third place um, again in this edition. Um, but you'll see also Hong Kong, Singapore, along with New York and London, um, are really firmly established at the top of the table, and that's the uh, target for other centres uh, to, to address. Taking a regional analysis, so a brief look at Western Europe first of all. Uh, London, as we said, re retains its first place. Uh, Frankfurt has moved into the top 10, moved back into the top 10 uh, in this edition of the GFCI, um, and we suspect that is a benefit um, of the UK leaving the European Union. Um, Luxembourg had performed well in the last edition of the index um, and is still uh, firmly in the top 20. So the, we're looking very closely to see uh, whether London's position uh, holds up against uh, increasingly stiff competition. Uh, in Asia Pacific, just noting here Hong Kong, of course, in fourth place, um, and showing that um, across the, across the top of the uh, GFCI, uh, we now have um, a large number of Asia Pacific centres uh, firmly established in the top ten and the top twenty um, of the index, and we expect that to continue. Uh, in North America. Um, we have uh, you know, mixed results uh, for North American centres, um, but uh, generally doing well and holding their own. Um, San Francisco just fell out of the top 10 this time, um, but may, may well be back. In the Middle East and Africa, uh, Dubai um, hangs on to its leading position, um, although drops very slightly uh, in the ratings. Um, and just to note that uh, Casablanca remains the leading African centre, uh, although African centres in this edition um, did take a slight hit. Uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, the, the centres in, in this part of the world bounce back after um, some quite uh, significant falls in GFCI 28. Uh, there's a renewed confidence uh, in the region, um, um, but still uh, trailing in terms of the uh, global uh, rankings 
uh, with the British Virgin Islands at 58th um, in, in the world, the leading centre in Latin America. Turn to Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Um, Moscow has performed well in this uh, edition, um, but again, it's very similar to Latin America um, and, and the Caribbean. Um, the, the, this sector or this part of the world um, trails slightly in terms of its performance uh, against other uh, regions of the world. Within the GFCI, um, we char characterize financial centers um, in 12 different sectors, um, global, uh, international and local, and then these four uh, sectors you can see across the top, broad and deep, um, diversified, specialist and t contenders. Um, and what we see is that increasingly um, the, the leading centers in the GFCI fall into the broad and deep category. In other words, they've developed um, you know, the quality and the range and breadth of their financial services. And they are global because they are uh, well connected uh, with other centers across the world. Um, and <coughs> Hong Kong, of course, falls clearly into this category. One of the analysis we do is to look at uh, the index by running the, uh, the, the model separately using only the survey responses that come from people working uh, in different industry sectors. Um, we show here uh, the rankings that come out of this. You'll see some interesting results. Uh, New York, of course, uh, does well uh, pretty much across the board, um, but people working in insurance uh, rated Shanghai, Singapore and Beijing uh, above New York for insurance, uh, which is um, a, a tribute to uh, what's been going on in, in those cities. Um, you'll see that Hong Kong here um, rates um, variously across the, the industry sectors, um, and it is of interest to financial uh, centers uh, to look at their profile in this kind of analysis uh, to see where they may need to do uh, make more effort uh, or to improve their, their reputation. Talking of reputation, we, we can also run an analysis of reputational advantage. Um, what this does is take the uh, raw assessment results from the survey we run uh, against the um, overall rating that comes out of the uh, index process. Um, many of the top centers in the index, Singapore, London, New York, Shanghai, Beijing, Hong Kong, um, are in the uh, top range in terms of reputational advantage. Uh, this means that their reputation gives them um, you know, a, uh, an advantage in terms of the uh, GFCI rating. Um, other centers um, have very high reputational advantages, places like uh, Gift City Gujarat and Qingdao, um, which suggests that they um, are marketing very well what they do. At the other end of the scale, we can measure reputational disadvantage. So this is the negative reputational advantage. Um, and the centers on this, um, this page are the ones that we believe um, are actually doing better than their reputation would show. Um, so you know, if people only knew uh, how good they were, uh, we think they would be scoring higher uh, in the GFCI and in the, in the assessments. Um, so there's a task at this end of the table for people to market more successfully what they are doing, uh, because people at the moment uh, aren't aware of just what good quality work is going on in those centers. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Professor Manelli in a moment, uh, but just to say that we um, look across a range of areas of competitiveness when we develop the GFCI. We believe it's important that centers are good at business environment, human capital infrastructure, financial sector development, and reputation um, if they're going to be a truly leading center. Um, and I'll leave you with, uh, with that thought. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Um, I just want to draw a few, a few points of attention uh, to some of the some of the great detail that's provided by this index and by the, the surrounding work to it. I'd first just like to point at uh, areas of competitiveness. And one of the great things here launching with Hong Kong is to see how strong Hong Kong is across the board. This has been an observation of ours for many years that to be a truly global financial center, you have to be good in almost all the categories. Uh, specialist centers hit a limit. And Hong Kong has clearly broken that many years ago, to be honest. Uh, but it is interesting to see that huge amount of strength. 
Um, the second thing I'd like to point out is that there are genuine changes in the index over time. And I've picked on three centers just for a quick uh, look. And I believe that those of you doing research in this sector might like to have a peek at some of this as, as you're moving forward. I mean, the first is Frankfurt, uh, clearly with many of the changes that we've witnessed in Europe, particularly with regard to Brexit, uh, the, the, uh, the departure of the United Kingdom from the European Union. Uh, because of Brexit, uh, we've seen a lot of change. And here it's very clear that Frankfurt is moving very, very fast on banking and banking and the regulation associated with that, with the European Central Bank, for example, being based in Frankfurt, has led to that enormous change. Second center you might have a look at, just for variety, would be Sydney. Uh, one of the intriguing things about Sydney, of course, has been a huge uh, improvement, in, at least to see by people in, in the industry, in the government and regulatory environment there. And this has, again, led to most of its changes in its competitiveness rank because it zeroes in on a leading. Uh, on, on leading. And finally, um, I might uh, point to, to Hong Kong, um, our co-host today, where there's been general improvement, as we've seen. Uh, but in particular, I might pick on, as, as did Mr. Hui in his remarks, insurance, uh, with Hong Kong emerging very strongly as an insurance center, uh, much to the uh, interest of those of us in London who live uh, less than uh, half a mile from Lloyd's of London. So those are just some things that you can see in terms of there is really rapid change going on in this area for those once you look uh, just beneath that top level of who who is who. We spend too much time, I think, on the, the absolute ranking in GFCI and not as much on, on some of the detail. And I'd encourage you to explore that detail. Uh, and that leads me into two areas I'd just like to bring to folks' attention. There's a bit of a blurring, I, I feel, in, in two, two areas. One is the use of technology, and the second is what do we mean by a financial center, both of which are important to us here at CN looking ahead. Uh, on the first, I look, I point you to the fact that we do have a fintech ranking. This is outside of our smart centers index, which is looking at technology in the round. This is just on fintech. Hong Kong scores very, very strongly here, as you can see. But it does shake up the rankings a fair bit here, where uh, sectors like Shenzhen rise quite significantly. San Francisco, as you might expect, uh, Tel Aviv, for example. Uh, and what is intriguing here for me is that we're not just seeing fintech, but we're also seeing tech fin. And this blurring of technology and finance might be a very, uh, very deep deepening trend for us as we're conducting our work. The second trend I might point to is about clustering. Um, as we look. Uh, again, around the world, uh, this next slide shows that one of the things that you're finding is that people are moving to work from home. Now, this is a fairly obvious thing to all of us during COVID-19. Uh, those of us who had more severe lockdowns, um, I, I've been at home for some time working, uh, are certainly experiencing this. Uh, but what was interesting is when we asked this question six months ago, uh, it was not as pronounced in Asia uh, Pacific, for example and other regions. What's happened has been that in Europe, most people believe there's going to be a quite a significant shift to working from home. And that was as it turned out in the last index. But since the last index, there's been a greater swing in uh, Eastern Europe, Latin America, even North America, to people believing that working from home might be a more permanent fixture of financial services work going ahead. Of course, this leads us uh, here at CN and CDI uh, to question how will we be defining these centers going forward without the convenience of a delineated line? And I think we're seeing this in areas like China with just today's launch, uh, but also, of course, the Bay Area concept of uh, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and, and Hong Kong. So a lot out there, and I just point to those two particular trends of uh, fintech blurring with wider technology and also the concept of a financial center changing. So with that, uh, I would like to hand on, if I might, to our next guest, which is uh, Dr. Yu Ling Chu, uh, our colleague from CDI, who's going to address us from Shenzhen. Next page, please. Next slide, please. Um, please help me to change to the next slide. Uh, 
uh, I only see my introduction slide, so please help me to go to the next slide. Okay, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to be here to share with you the performance of China's mainland city for the GFCI 20s. And uh, we are working with uh, uh, UK Wisin for quite a long time. And uh, we notice a very important trend that is uh, in China, we have a rising financial center as a cluster. This is not only a concern for the financial industry in China. And uh, you know that uh, more and more international think tank and financial institutions and the financial practitioners also pay attention to the China's mainland financial center development and uh, the corresponding opportunities that we can discover. Next slide, please. Next slide. And you can say that uh, in China, uh, currently we have uh, 12 cities that have already been included into GFCI. Shanghai, Beijing, and Shenzhen rank as the top 10 centers. Guangzhou, Chengdu, Qingdao, and ranked as top 50. Uh, uh, financial centers. But according to this table, you can also see a clear polarization of the cities. Hangzhou, Tianjin, Dalian, and those cities, the ranking is uh, beyond the top 100. And this is a general ranking for many cities. Next page, please. Oh, this is another slide in showing you New York, London, those top financial centers are clearly seen on the table, but still for many China cities, we have a big room to further leverage our potential to catch up with those world-class financial centers. You can see for New York and London, on all criteria, they are ranking at the top three, where for domestic China cities, only Shanghai can top rank as top three in terms of infrastructure. Next slide, please. Uh, just now, our London friend also mentioned about the reputation advantage. And let me just uh, explain to you. Actually, we use the score from the question now and uh, the difference between the question now and uh, the uh, comprehensive study to help to assess the reputational advantage of a city. And according to JFCI 29, we clearly understand international investment community pay much attention to the potential of mainland China cities, for example, like uh, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and Qingdao. The uh, reputational advantages of those centers being ranked as top 10 in the international community. And this also shows uh, our expectation over those cities and their performance for the next coming years. Next page, please. Well, from the ranking, we can also see another result. FinTech has already become a very good bonus for the mainland China cities. So besides the traditional criteria in GFCI, we'll also include FinTech and Green Finance as new criteria for the ranking. And you can say that for the FinTech ranking in uh, for domestic China, the ranking is much higher than the comprehensive ranking. For Shanghai, Beijing, and Shenzhen, they are ranking as a top three, a two, top three, and a top four in the international community, which is well performed compared with all the international financial centers. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And uh, just now, and we heard from our London friends in talking about the importance of Hong Kong. Shanghai is also the most important financial center in mainland China, and Shanghai is used to be a uh, catching up with other international players. But now Shanghai is already a uh, well performed in international financial business. In the past, compared with Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, Shanghai is uh, underperformed, but with a new list. Uh, release and uh, Shanghai has already outperformed Hong Kong and Singapore and uh, started to narrow the gap between South with uh, London and uh, New York. Next slide, please.
And uh, at the very end of my report, let me also share with you the fast rising financial center in domestic China, that is Shenzhen. You know that uh, no matter for the uh, environment or reputation, Shenzhen is making big progress, especially from the uh, down bottom right, you can also see that uh, the financial development of Shenzhen is ranking as top four in China, in the world, especially on fintech, green uh, finance. These are all bonus to Shenzhen's uh, financial development. So I can simply say that uh, Shenzhen is still going to have a promising future for the future uh, in financial development. Thank you very much. Thanks for your listening. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Yu, and uh, we would like to thank you for, for that work. And now, if I could, uh, I'm delighted to hand over to uh, Dr. King Lun, who's uh, an executive director and board member with the Financial Services Development Council, uh, to make some remarks about Chinese financial centers. Dr. King Lun. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, we have seen a lot of uh, numbers and a lot of uh, uh, detailed analysis of the report. Uh, so, but I still want to share some numbers with uh, everyone. Uh, um, it, it, we are very excited about this uh, Greater Bay Area concept, and I want to highlight this is again another opportunity for Hong Kong to further expand our international financial center status. You know, but as we all know, that Hong Kong has been a super connector right, uh, for mainland China and the rest of the global markets. But there is this another exciting opportunity coming up. So I said I wanted to share some numbers. So uh, here they are. You know, uh, the Greater Bay Area, um, first of all, comprises uh, two special administrative regions of Hong Kong and Macau, and nine uh, municipalities of uh, Guangdong province. So altogether, we have 70 million people. And you know how big 70 million is? More than the, uh, the population in the UK, and in terms of GDP, it's 1.7 trillion. And again, you know how big is that? That's the size of Canada. And in terms of um, surface area, you know, 56,000 square kilometer. That's more than three times the size of San Francisco Bay. Uh, so here, you know, we, um, uh, my uh, colleague uh, Chris. Uh, mentioned uh, Stock Connect, Bond Connect earlier. And here, for GBA, we can also talk about Wealth Management Connect. It is allowing overseas managers, service providers, one day to sell their products into the Greater Bay Area. And vice versa, you know, we can offer products manufactured in Greater Bay Area to the rest of the world. And so this you know, can open up a huge opportunity. Now, coming back to uh, the Chinese financial centers, uh, you know, we're delighted. That, uh, we have two of the top four, uh, that is Shanghai and Hong Kong, uh, and among the top ten, you know, we have you know two more. So that that is really very uh, uh, exciting uh, for for us. But the, the, the role Hong Kong can play um, is really the international aspect of it. You know, we have a common law system, we have a world-class infrastructure, and a very deep talent pool. And very importantly for financial market, liquidity and product complexity, risk management tools. Uh, we, we, we have those readily available. Uh, so this super connector role, we believe you know, there are many, many opportunities ahead for everyone that, you know, who are interested in the growth of China. Uh, and I would also like to emphasize that is uh, not just China. Hong Kong can be a platform for the whole region, right? Because we already have the most successful IPO market in the region. And uh, as Chris mentioned earlier, uh, and in terms of uh, the size of our asset management industry, 
also we are the largest in the region and just behind Switzerland as the largest private wealth management center as well. So um, it's not just this. Now we are also taking the lead in some of the more important global development trends, such as ESG. Uh, again, uh, Chris mentioned that earlier. Uh, we again have a very important role to play. That is you know, uh, going back to a connected role. How we can actually reach or, or acting as, as a bridge uh, between mainland China and the rest of the world, especially Europe. Uh, in terms of taxonomy, so uh, no, um, I'll stop here because uh, you know I can carry on for a much longer time. But um, I, I think we have seen a, 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 we have heard a lot of very detailed analysis. Maybe you know we can leave time uh, for you know the Q and A. Dr. King Loon, that's fantastic. Thank you. In fact, we do have a lot of Q and A. And if I may. Uh, I'd like to direct the first one to you. Uh, so we have Verena in Germany, and she is curious, going on your theme of the super connector, how important is the EU-China comprehensive agreement on investment to you in this regard? Uh, that's a great question. This is very important. Again, um, we believe we can play a very important middleman role because, uh, uh, as I highlighted earlier, you know, we have you know, a, a common law system that is well practiced uh, and accepted by global investors. Uh, we have the infrastructure, uh, and that that that's you know, where we believe you know, we can contribute to this you know, important uh, strategic development. That's super. I have a question here for uh, Dr. Yu. Ah, fantastic! There we go, uh, Dr. Yu. Um, we have Ian in London is curious. How important has fintech been to the rise of Shenzhen? Is it really just a specialist center? Dr. Yu? Oh, apologies. Well, I'll move on if I can while I just wait. I'll repeat that question to Dr. Yu in a moment. Um, but if I could, we have a question here for um, from Bob McDowell, uh, and I believe this is directed to you, uh, Dr. King Loon. Uh, it would be interesting to hear more detail about the development of the captive insurance market in Hong Kong in terms of demand and projected growth. Right. Um, yeah. Um, I I'm glad to see from your report, uh, Professor, that uh, insurance uh, as a sector uh, scores very highly uh, for Hong Kong. In fact, you know, uh, we, we are uh, looking at the whole development of the insurance sector very holistically. Uh, you know, we, we are looking at, uh, in fact, even uh, the, the policy uh, budget speech that uh, Chris mentioned earlier, you know, we have uh, mentioned uh, the insurance linked securities market. Uh, so uh, definitely, you know, we want to make sure that you know, we provide the uh, fundraising platform. Uh, for insurance companies for matching their liability. Uh, you know, everyone now, uh, is familiar with the concept of catastrophe bond. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I hope, you know, we don't, we won't have another pandemic, uh, like COVID-19. But, you know, there will be natural disaster. You know, how, how do we hatch those risks? You know, we want to provide, you know, the, uh, capital market infrastructure, uh, for fundraising, for, you know, risk management. Uh, so, uh, insurance, Definitely is a key sector for us. Uh, as uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, we do want to provide a fundraising platform uh, for the whole uh, region uh, if possible. Uh, Maragtas uh, from the Philippines in Manila, uh, thanks you uh, very much for the event and for hosting it. Um, and she's very interested, he's very interested, excuse me, in the, the Philippines has a lot of work to do to catch up. Uh, priority is, you know, connectivity as well as systems and infrastructure to further develop financial markets, including the untapped potential of the Philippine regions. Do you have any advice and recommendations for countries such as the Philippines uh, nearby to Hong Kong and China? Sorry. Sorry. Any, any advice you might have for uh, regions in the Philippines? and how they might relate uh, to financial development, uh, increase their financial development by working with China. 
All right. Okay. Yes. Um. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, that that they they that there are two ways. You know, uh, I believe you know global investors uh, can uh, look at China. Definitely, you know, we're a huge domestic market. Uh, for those who want to tap into you know, the domestic market, I think uh, definitely you know they, they consider establishing a local presence there. Um, so if you're talking about financial investment, uh, you know, there, 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 there are ways you can you can do that. Or alternatively, uh, you know, you can look at Hong Kong as a stepping stone, uh, you know, whereby you know you can uh, you know. Uh, go through Hong Kong uh, and establish uh, Hong Kong as a stepping stone into the mainland China because uh, to begin with the this, this system, the infrastructure, you know, might probably be more familiar to uh, to you. Uh, but over time, uh, you know, you can expand your local presence. Uh, it's quite common. In fact, if you uh, look at uh, say a, a huge market like the US or even uh, in the UK, um, it's very Keep a common for companies to have multiple offices in the country in major cities, right? And and in the case of China, I mean, definitely Hong Kong is one uh, that is right up there for consideration because of the, the uh, reasons I just mentioned, uh, familiarity. Uh, but in terms of uh, the size of the market, obviously, um, is where the domestic uh, China uh, can offer. So therefore, it, it very much depends. On the stage of your investment uh, consideration, uh, but I would say uh, it's not a binary uh, decision. I think um, it, it's beneficial to have multiple offices in, in, a, in a big country like uh, China, as like just like what most com companies would do in a big country like you know uh, U.S., Canada, uh, Europe. Yeah, so it's always very interesting that federal uh, distinction amongst nations or or, uh, or supranational centers. Um, this is a question for you, uh, Mike, Mike Wardle. Um, it's from Anthony Rowley, who's uh, with the South China Morning Post and also Asia Asset Management in Tokyo. Uh, mm -hmm. And he would like to know, how do you assess the chances of Fin City Tokyo uh, in seeking to make Tokyo a more attractive financial center in Asia, uh, especially in terms of its fund management capacity? Yes. Yeah. Um, um, definitely. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, I think um, that, that, that there's great competition amongst leading Asian uh, financial centers. Um, and I know that Tokyo um, and Fin City Tokyo have been doing a lot of work to analyze um, the financial ecosystem uh, in Tokyo uh, to start addressing um, areas for development. In terms of investment management, um, you know, as in all financial centers, um, there's the need to achieve a balance uh, in terms of the regulatory structures uh, and the operational structures um, around communication, around the um, standards for uh, reporting, um, to make sure that there's good dialogue between asset holders and asset managers. Um, and uh, I think the, the, the depth of analysis that FinCity Tokyo has been doing uh, stands them in good stead in addressing that and getting the balance right between uh, regulation and support. Uh, for the financial service industry. Uh, Dr. King Lung Zahir, who uh, works with Lloyds of London, is curious, you know, will London remain an important financial partner for Hong Kong and the rest of Asia, particularly with regard to insurance? Uh, oh, yes, uh, uh, definitely. I think, uh, you know, we would like to see uh, the whole of Europe as one uh, big uh, market. So uh, UK, uh, because of its advanced infrastructure, uh, I think, yeah, definitely it still has a lot of uh, uh, strength uh, and attraction. Uh, so definitely, you know, we, we, we want to uh, explore uh, further collaboration opportunities. And when it comes to um, the insurance market, yeah, um, definitely um, we already have some very successful ins insurance company, uh, you know, from Europe uh, operating in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, so I believe, you know, we can Deepen that collaboration, just like uh, what I mentioned that the uh, insurance linked securities market. You know, we can you know uh, make it as an Asian time zone hub, and vice versa. You know, uh, London, Europe can have an opportunity to uh, create a, 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 a hub in the European time zone. Uh, Mike, this is a question for you from Narayanian Sumasundaram. Um, seeing that Hong Kong has risen and, and Tokyo slipped a bit. Uh, do you have any particular bilateral insights into what happened that drove Hong Kong's rise and pushed Tokyo down? 
Um, first of all, to say that, um, as I said in my main presentation, um, the the margins are very close uh, between centres um, at the top of the um, GFCI index. Um, so, um, fr from from addition to addition, um, I wouldn't read too much into the fact there's been you know small changes in, in ratings uh, between centres. Uh, this is very much a longitudinal research um, uh, uh, project, um, and what's important is the is, is the long term trend. Um, that said, um, I think that uh, you know the the kinds of factors which um, are likely to have affected uh, the reputation of Tokyo as opposed to Hong Kong um, is that, uh, that, that that there is a um, a question uh, still amongst international investors about how open uh, Japanese um the japanese market is um and 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 how good the uh, skills are uh, in ter particularly in terms of language skills uh, in a business which is mostly conducted in english and so i think there's the, 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 there's going to be a tension for some while um between tokyo's aspiration uh, to be uh, right at the top of the table and uh, leading in asia um and the, the time it'll take um just to uh, develop uh, it's uh, human capital in particular uh, to be able to operate on a truly global level. So I think that, that there's a very slight um, differentiation there between uh, Tokyo and Hong Kong, but I think it's probably enough to make that, that slight difference uh, in the reputation and achievements of the two centers. Uh, Dr. King Lun, uh, e Ling Ding uh, observes a, a fairly large movement of funds from Hong Kong to Singapore. Uh, could you elaborate on the reasons for that and how you see this going forward, perhaps preventing it? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? I didn't I, I get, get that, that clearly. Uh, e Ling Ding uh, sees a large movement of funds from Hong Kong to Singapore. Uh, hmm. You may not agree with that, but can you elaborate on the reasons and what you're, think, what you're thinking is going forward? The, uh yeah, um, I, I think uh, Hong Kong and Singapore are, are, are two very important financial centers uh, in Asia. Uh, as I uh, alluded to earlier, you know, when people make business decisions, uh, it's not binary. It depends on uh, you know uh, what they uh, look for. Uh, we, uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, all we, we all have our own competitive strengths and weaknesses. Uh, so uh, I would say it is complementary. Uh, so. It very much depends on uh, what investors look for, right? uh, and I, I can highlight again uh, the strength uh, of Hong Kong being a super connector uh, to uh, mainland China, and the uh, benefits of that is not just an asset uh, access to you know a, a vast market, but also because of the benefits of our liquidity, our infrastructure. You know, we can, you know, hopefully, you know, be a regional uh, financial center servicing, you know, uh, other type of investors and uh, uh, companies. Yeah, fundraising uh, for one fundraising purposes, for example, and risk management as well. Okay, uh, Mike, uh, Eddie Young is asking, how would Brexit uh, change the position of London, um, and? He, he he's very very curious about that. I also have a few other questions related to whether or not you see London continuing uh, to fall in in the indices, or whether you believe this is temporary. Yes, I, th I think the um, we don't have a definitive answer to the question yet. I think is the is the first thing to say. Although London's rating fell in this edition of the index, um, it, it it rose in the last edition. Um, and as I say, the, the, the longer term trend is, is what's important. Um, but New York has now held the top position in the index um, for a number of editions uh, after London had held the top spot for, uh, for, for quite a while. Um, and so there was a sense that London is, 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 has lost some of its um, you know, reputation and strengths um, compared with um, New York as its, its main world competitor. The question is whether that continues. Uh, in terms of a trend and whether London um, loses its second place uh, in the rankings um, at some point. Um, and uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, there's now only one point uh, between London and Shanghai, one point between Shanghai and Hong Kong, one point between Hong Kong and Singapore. It is very tight um, and London, I think, is at risk 
um, of being overtaken um, by uh, another financial centre. Um, we also see um, some uh, positioning, I guess, within the EU centres and uh, Swiss centres, um, and you know, the strengths of Frankfurt, uh, Luxembourg, Amsterdam um, you know, are coming through. Uh, they have taken some business uh, from London, um, and we will we'll have to see uh, whether that is a continuing trend. Um, and so I, th I think it's probably too early to say you know, what the impact of leaving the EU has been. This, uh, you know, most of the data on which the GFCI was based um, is you know, current at the end of 2020, uh, rather than being uh, current uh, at this moment. Um, so we'll be watching very carefully um, in the next two editions of the GFCI uh, to see whether the uh, the, the, action, the, the reality of leaving the EU um, starts to have an impact on the data which underlies the index. Well, Maximilian Bierbaum makes a, an observation that the factors that caused London to drop from second to third place are principally the business environment and the reputational and general areas of competitiveness. So thank you for that, Maximilian. Um, a question uh, to you, Dr. Kingland, from Martin Watkins in London. Um, He's curious if you could, uh, uh, do you believe that the adoption of digital assets, new regulations, and the introduction of a central bank digital currency, which has all been going on in, in China, how is that going to have rankings? Uh, sorry, what, what effect do you think that might have on the ranking of cities in China as financial centers? Yeah, I, I think first of all, talk, uh, talk about virtual assets first. I think this is an uh, uh, inevitable trend, you know, with the advance of technology. And I think the blockchain technology is very much uh, ingrained in, into our, our, our financial market now. Uh, so, uh, virtual assets, uh, as you know, a lot of experts here uh, know what more than I do, but basically, uh, it is just a securitization, uh, of assets, right? Or, or, you know, in a digital format. Uh, so in Hong Kong, uh, the Securities and Features Commission recently, uh, issued the very first, uh, virtual asset trading, uh, platform license in Hong Kong. Uh, so it, it signals that the, that this market is here to stay. Um, so obviously, you know, regulations in terms of investor uh, protection is, is important. Uh, and that also uh, brings on to uh, the concept of digital currency. Uh, uh, so the, this, again, I, I would say uh, it is a natural uh, development. Now, uh, e-wallet is so common, uh, you know, all obviously, you know, that the e-commerce market in uh, mainland China is uh, very advanced. But even, you know, uh, other parts of the world, people are very familiar with it now. Uh, especially with COVID-19, people, uh, more people uh, are using uh, digital payment methods. Um, so I, I say this will definitely be uh, a major trend globally. You know, we know a lot of uh, central banks are looking into this uh, development. Uh, so, because the e-commerce uh, environment in China is very mature, so uh, I, I think you know, China, the introduction of the uh, ECMY uh, is now being in the testing stage. So uh, we are all you know, watching this development. It, 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 it truly will bring financial inclusion uh, to reality. Right? So there are a lot of. Uh, I think to me, this uh, will be a, a big. Contribution to the development of uh, you know uh, the, our society, you know, you know helping the uh, underprivileged to have access to uh, financial services. Yes, now we're watching it with great interest. That's for sure. It's a it's a very intriguing experiment, and a, a sign again that uh, of how things have shifted over the many years of the index. That people in the West are looking for the technological innovation in finance uh, coming uh, really from Asia. Uh, Mike, a, a political question here. Kevin Lee uh, is curious. He says that the Heritage Foundation recently merged Hong Kong uh, with China in its economic freedom rankings. Um, he was curious, you know, what might what might you think this is going to do to Hong Kong's ranking going forward, uh, particularly in terms of industry subsectors such as government and regulatory? And did you have any color on that? Yeah, thank you. Um, the, the, uh, as you know, um, there's over 140 uh, measures now taken into account in the GFCI. Um, and so the you know, direct impact of one of those individual measures is unlikely to be 
uh, to be huge. Um, but but that said, um, you know, th- th- there is a, a, an issue, I guess, um, around uh, some of the um, indicators, the quantitative indicators, uh, which deal with open government, with freedom, with um, government effectiveness, you know, that reputational group, um, and some of the business environment group, um, where um, you know, it, it is always going to be difficult for Chinese centres, I think, uh, in the current uh, system, uh, to uh, move towards the top of those rankings. Um, and so it does have an effect um, on the uh, positioning uh, of Chinese centres and uh, Hong Kong, um, in that um, you know, a, 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 an open and free uh, system of economy and law uh, is seen as a very attractive proposition uh, to people wanting to bring inward investment into uh, financial centres. So the individual change um, you know, in terms of the Heritage Foundation's uh, scoring may not have a great difference, but the overall position uh, is that um, financial centres uh, that have more uh, freedom in terms of law and government effectiveness um, are likely to perform well over the long term. Uh, Dr. King Loon, uh Tim Lam is uh, very interested in your thoughts, uh, and I think it's uh, spurred on by your comments earlier about multiple centers, and particularly with your perspective from Hong Kong. Do you see the future development of financial services across China as being one of center specialization or competition across more broadly based financial centers? Uh, I would say um, it, it, it is a, a complementary. Um, let's take for example, we've talked about GPA earlier. You know, it, it really it, it is a hub of uh, technological innovation in, in China, right? Uh, and Shanghai, with its uh, history, uh, with uh, its uh, infrastructure, um, is definitely a, a major financial center, uh, but uh, not necessarily focusing on just technology. Right? And Hong Kong, as an international financial center, uh, really tries to bring the best of East and West together. It's a big melting pot. So, you know, we all have our, our strengths and weaknesses. I said, uh, you know, no one is perfect. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the key to me is how we work together in partnership to grow the pie bigger for everyone. And also, most importantly, to the benefits of all the uh, stakeholders. Uh, Dr. Yu, if you, if you were able to get to the microphone, um... I just wanted to return to that question we had earlier, if you if you had a moment, and that was very much along the lines of is, how how important has fintech been to the development of Shenzhen, and I think that relates uh, to some degree to uh, Dr. Yu's comments here about specialization. You know, is is the future of Shenzhen that of uh, a fintech specialist, or are there aspirations to be a much more broadly based center? Actually, I'd like to use two cases to answer your question by illustrating two Shenzhen cases. The first company is Ping An Insurance Company in Shenzhen. Ping An Insurance Company is a com- uh, insurance company with the highest market cap in the world. And uh, for the past few years, its policy volume increased by more than 10 times. But the employee number never increased for the past one decade. Ping An is leveraged the technology to replace the man power to improve the work efficiency for the uh, real, uh, for the insurance agents according to the world institution for the insurance uh, technology patent ping an is the company with uh, the largest patent in the uh, insure tech industry so you can clearly say that uh, for financial institutions in shenzhen they are leverage fintech to improve their working efficiency and competitiveness and the second case i'd like to share with you is way bank in shenzhen we bank uh, has no branches or outlet besides Shenzhen, and uh, in Shenzhen they only have a uh, one physical outlet. But uh, you can say that uh, the source of the funds and the source of the client of the We 
Bank comes from all of China, covering more than、uh, tens of provinces in China. Financial institutions in Shenzhen is leveraging fintech to、uh, broaden their business scope and further improve their influence. So, by these two cases, you can see fintech has already become a very important driving force for Shenzhen to become an international financial center. And so, I hope these two cases can answer your question to some extent. You also asked about the specialization of Shenzhen in the near future. You know that I myself is responsible for the 45-year plan for Shenzhen to become an international financial center. We clearly indicated that Shenzhen would like to build as a World-class fintech center in the world, and now we already have a lot of financial institutions leveraging fintech to improve their work efficiency, and they also give valuable output. For example, their business model, so that they can take more market share in the international arena. So Shenzhen is going to better consolidate our advantages on fintech, so that we can build ourselves into an international financial center specialized with fintech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor Yu. That's very kind of you.、Um, I'm going to take just one final question in the time available.、Um, that's from Amanda Wong, and I think it's directed at you, Mike.、Uh, you know, how much was the pandemic a factor affecting the rankings of the centers? And also, in your opinion, as we move out with vaccination,、uh, do you have any projections on what what it might do to rankings in the future? Okay.、Um, <laughs> A big, big question,、uh, but I'll do my best, Amanda.、Um, first of all, the、um, the effect on the rankings of the pandemic, I think, has been on the reputation, really, of economies rather than necessarily financial centres.、Uh, governments that are seen to have done well、uh, in managing、uh, the effects of the pandemic,、uh, for example, South Korea,、um, have seen an improvement、um, in the、um, the、uh, scoring given to the financial centres. Uh, because the underlying economy is seen to be、uh, a safer bet.、Um, so, for example, Seoul and Busan in South Korea have moved up in the rankings in this edition, and I suspect that is to do partly、um, with the success of Korea、uh, in managing the pandemic.、Um, so, there has been that kind of impact.、Uh, more generally, we've seen the centres at the top of the、uh, index rating、uh, fall back in the ratings, and we think there's、uh, just a general lack of confidence potentially、uh, in the future of the world economy. Um, because people aren't sure what's going to happen as we come out of the、um, the period of the pandemic.、Uh, with vaccinations, of course,、um, you know, things will start to reopen.、Uh, the question is,、um, how will it be different when it reopens?、Uh, we've demonstrated, I think, over the last year,、um, that there is <clears throat> there are many occasions where, in the past,、uh, people would have flown around the world、um, to meet together to gather,、um, and we've demonstrated that is less necessary. Uh, than people thought it was. So I think the whole concept of what a city is,、um, how important it is to gather in person for events and for meetings,、um, has shifted. And I think the centres which、um, do best going forward are those that manage to blend properly、um, the new opportunities offered by digital um, business um, and the traditional strengths of good reputation, sound management going forward. Thank you. Well, we come to the end of time, and、uh, and therefore our final slide.、Uh, I'd like to, if I could, make just a few very brief remarks.、Uh, the first is what an amazing world it is, and there are some advantages、uh, to the pandemic, as we've seen in changing attitudes towards business travel and video conferencing. We've had 450 people, more than 450 people, online、uh, this morning and this afternoon, which is a real、uh, change in the times. And I think that CDI and、uh, HKFSD and Zian are delighted that we don't have to pick up the tab at the wine bar afterwards. So <laughs> that's that's,、uh, that's that's one of the good things, I guess. But、uh, we'll be very happy to pick up the wine tab at a future event when we all manage to get together physically.、Uh, second thing I'd like to do is to thank very much the audience today. What an enormous audience and what really pertinent and sensible questions. And thank you so much for sending them in and participating today. It's been Uh, about as participative as 450 plus people can be. So I'd like to thank you for that.、Um, I'd also like to thank most obviously our sponsors.、Uh, so you know, without、uh, the Hong Kong Financial Services Development Council, without our friends at the China Development Institute,、uh, these things wouldn't be possible. And it is amazing to see two large regions, Europe and the Bay Area, cooperating on on this. And I, 
much, much more may it come. It is that. And very finally, if I could, um, I would like to thank my colleague, uh, Mike Wardle and the team for the preparation of the index and for the presentation today, Mike. I'd like to thank, uh, Dr. Yu for those very interesting insights, uh, from China and from Shenzhen. And Dr. King Loon, thank you most especially, uh, representing the sponsor today and for participating in such an open and fun way. We really, really appreciate your insights. So with that, I'll say thanks to all, and we hope to see you uh, in September when we'll be doing index number 30, we believe. Uh, and for those of you who'd like to participate and pr provide your views, uh, you can take the survey itself at the web link there below, globalfinancialcenters.net forward slash survey. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.